Hello, I'm Jim Deeks. Welcome to another edition of Canada Files. Our guest on this episode is Stephen Lewis, a former Canadian ambassador to the United Nations. Born in Toronto, the son of a renowned national politician, Stephen himself served as a political leader before going on to the UN. He later served as deputy director of UNICEF and as the UN's special envoy on the epidemic of HIV AIDS in Africa. He is revered and respected by Canadian politicians across all spectrums and by statesmen and diplomats the world over. And just into his early 80s, as you'll see, he's still going strong. Stephen, let's start at the end first. Not, not the real end, because you've got many miles to go, but as you look back on a very varied and accomplished career, what in your mind is your greatest achievement, aside, of course, from producing a fine and accomplished family? Uh, you know, I haven't looked at achievements in terms of gradation, but I think the moments in my life politically were what I most valued for what I did subsequently, which when I look back on it is faintly ironic because it wasn't a tremendously successful political career, but I learned so much and I was so deeply immersed and I cared so much about understanding the evolution of social justice that I, I think politics would be the transcendent moment if such there is. That's very interesting because basically you could say that so much of your life has been, if not practicing politics, it's been involved in politics. So you learned early the art of compromise and, and the art of dealing with varying forces. Oh, I never learned the art of compromise, Jim. I, I, I am a fundamentalist. I'm a, I'm a democratic socialist who will be laid in my grave as, in that ideological form. But I, I did learn over time how to address certain issues strongly and in an uncompromising way, but in a way which didn't alienate the people with whom you're dealing. All right, let's go back to the beginning, to, to the early years. That's a few decades ago, but we won't mention how many. From the moment you drew your first breath, um, social democratic politics and public service was really in your blood, I assume. Yeah. Your father, David Lewis, was when you were born, already one of the top lieutenants in the left-wing political party, national party, then known as the CCF. One would imagine that you had a relatively intense political upbringing. Yes, I was indoctrinated from diapers onward, and at the age of three, I was licking envelopes in the basement of the CCF headquarters at the time. And quite naturally, there was an intense political dialogue. It, it, was, it was in the DNA of the family, and it prepared me for the political life that came thereafter. Your father was recognized throughout the country, even by those who didn't necessarily agree with his political persuasion. but. He was recognized as a very brilliant man, a very powerful, masterful orator, and basically a high achiever. What was he like as a father? Actually, it was a, it was a lovely relationship. He was a kind of mentor, tutor as a father. And, and we discussed these issues uh, of the day quite frequently. And your characterization of David is valid. He was an extraordinary human being. And Canadians warmed to him even if they didn't vote for him. This is a phenomenon I've learned to deal with in life. Um, but he wasn't an aggressive father. He wasn't particularly a disciplinary father. He had lived his life in the world of ideas, and my mom supported him in that. So, so that was the relationship. It was a relationship of, of uh, teacher and student. At what point did you realize, you know, I guess I'm a fairly intelligent young man, and maybe I should do the work that my dad does? Or were you always focused on perhaps getting into politics? Oh, yeah, I, I, and I don't think it was particularly premeditated or conscious. It just was a natural evolution of life that I would get involved politically. It was part of the family's history. It was part of my father's uh, father's history, my grandfather. You know, yes. it, uh, it was it was a remarkable uh, heritage that uh, started in uh, what was then the border of Poland and Russia in a little town called Svisloch, uh, where my grandfather was involved, and and then came right through David to me and and the family. You went to university, you actually went to a couple of universities, but 
surprisingly for such an intelligent young man, you never graduated. Tell us why. Because it, I, I just didn't enjoy it. I loved the camaraderie of all the other students. I was just a lousy student myself. I couldn't study. I couldn't immerse myself. I think I learned a great deal at university, uh, but the idea of getting through it all uh, didn't appeal to me, so I opted out. But you also opted to go to Africa. You yes. made a visit to Africa, and that interrupted any uh, sort of natural flow of your university career. Explain that, what happened there. When I left university, I immediately went to the United Kingdom to be a researcher for what was called the uh, Socialist International. It was really the British Labour Party. And while I was there, I received an invitation to attend something called the World Assembly of Youth in, in Ghana. Uh, it was supposed to be for a week. I stayed in Africa for more than a year. I fell in love with the continent. By the way, it turned out later that the World Assembly of Youth was a CIA front, so I am indebted to the CIA for the Americans who are watching this program. I had that funny entanglement early in life. I loved Africa. I was in Ghana, Nigeria, Sudan. I crossed, I drove across the continent, which was not supposed to be possible. Spent time in Uganda and Kenya. I was white. They assumed I could teach, and under those bogus credentials of color, I made my way through Africa. Africa later played a major part in your life and your career, and we'll get to that in a moment. But you did return from Ghana, and pretty soon thereafter, entered the world of politics, yes. which, as you say, was almost bread in the bone. Had you decided that um, this was indeed your calling? Or were you just going to give it a try? Or did you even have visions of being Premier of Ontario or Prime Minister <laughs> no, of Canada one I day? Had, I had no visions of that kind because I understood the role of the Democratic left well enough to realize that we were unlikely to be a government, either provincially or federally. But the art of politics, the practice of politics, the dealing with issues in the legislature, that had a tremendous appeal to me. Uh, I didn't know how long it would last. I was very lucky. I was very young. I was 25 or 26 and when I was elected and I stayed in until I was 40. By the way, I would make that recommendation to others. Get out early if you can because it leaves you with a whole life to lead thereafter. That's very interesting. You um, really had a meteoric rise in politics. You got in in 68 or 69 but very soon thereafter became the leader of the left-wing right. Democratic Party in the province of Ontario, which is kind of like the junior government of Canada in a sense. Um, I'm sure that most Canadians would have expected that you would succeed your father, who at the time was the head of the federal New Democratic Party. Yes. But you packed it in, in 1978. What happened? Well, uh, we, had, uh, we had become the official opposition in 1975. We reverted to third place, although we, had, we made a very respectable showing, but we stepped back. I had already been in there for 15 years. That's a long political life. By the way, when I was politically active in Ontario, as you yourself would recognize and remember, Jim, um, it was a very civilized political environment. It was a wonderful premier of Ontario. He was a conservative, but we were good friends. His name was Bill Davis. I value his friendship to, to, to this day. And it was, a, it, it was not filled with the venom and the animosity that is so characteristic of politics. In the United States, excessively. In Canada, unfortunately, evidently. Um, I lived in a time when the disputes across the floor of the legislature were intense, but they were not angry in a personal sense, and friendships remain. So after 15 years, I felt I had a young, growing family. I thought I'd like to try something else. Yep. And you did. You became a television commentator, True. and uh, you did a number of other things, both inside the party and outside. But in the mid-1980s, you accepted the invitation of the Conservative Prime Minister of Canada at the time, Brian Mulroney to become the Canadian ambassador to the United Nations. What was your view of the UN going into that job and 35 years later, what's your view of the UN today? It's a loaded question, I know. Well, well, going into the job, I was really naive. I didn't have a, uh, a 
considered or thoughtful view of the United Nations. I felt it was an indispensable international organization, but I didn't know a lot about its operation. And frankly, my colleagues, my staff at the United Nations were, were bewildered and uh, marginally humiliated that their, that their senior leader was so dumb and knew <laughs> so little about the practices of the UN. Over four years, I learned a great deal. How do I feel about it now? I feel that the Secretariat of the United Nations over the last decades, a two couple of decades from the time I was there in the 80s till now, has been increasingly inadequate to handle the extraordinary internal abrasive conflicts between and among countries. And we lack secretaries general and we lack leadership at the UN which can make a substantial difference to the world. So you can't do without it. You've got to have a meeting of nations, but it's not as effective as it should be. You did that role. You performed that role as Can uh, Canadian ambassador. And loved it. And, uh, and yeah. loved it. Yeah. And I know you were very effective and, and very much respected. A few years later, you went back into the UN yes. uh, in a uh, more functionary role as the deputy director of the United Nations Children, Children's Fund, or UNICEF, as we all know it. I know that children and children's literature are very close to your heart, but international children's welfare is, a, is another matter altogether. Tell us about that experience. Did, did you feel you were effective in that role? Um. Yes, I think so. I was in charge of international programming for UNICEF. It was an organization with billions of dollars to spend, with a serious cadre of, uh, of representatives and, and staff in most of the developing countries in the world. So we were able to affect the lives of children on the ground. We were, we were able to do everything from, from immunization through to dealing with child soldiers. It was the entire range of a child's life. And when you had a good representative and good leadership, in a given country, you could make a tremendous difference to the lives children led. And, and one of the most exciting things I did when I was at UNICEF, it was in the earliest stages of the Convention on the Rights of the Child. And one of my responsibilities was to make sure that the countries of the world ratified the convention and took it seriously and implemented its provisions. And that was, you know, to see that you could actually rescue children's lives, that you could, you could somehow transform the, the poverty and wretchedness to which so, one, so many of them seemed destined, that was exhilarating. Well, you moved on from that after a brief hiatus uh, into another role with the UN as special envoy for HIV AIDS in Africa, and that was at the beginning of this century. AIDS had been known for roughly 15 years at the right. time you took on the role. And in subsequent lectures and a book, which is called Race Against Time, which you wrote at, well, it was a series of lectures, but it became a book, you expressed serious disappointment with the world's inaction in dealing with HIV AIDS, especially in Africa. Did your criticism work at the time, or were you disappointed that it didn't work and that more attention wasn't and hasn't been paid to AIDS? I, I think, and it's difficult for me to make judgments about my own work, but, but I think it's a combination of both. I think that having an unusual voice at the UN because I took positions, and you weren't supposed to take positions, you were supposed to be terribly diplomatic. But I took very strong and frequently uncompromising positions about what was happening with the virus and the destruction and how so many countries felt like graveyards that, that, that you go through hospitals and witness the most soul-searing tragedy in front of you, you know, two people to every bed, people under the beds, uh, caskets rolling in out of the hospital wards, taking the dead away. Uh, you watch people die year after year, and, and, and the need to fight that and to get governments mobilized was, of course, the nature of the work. And I think that because I was allowed, I was Kofi Annan's representative, and, and his name was, was Gold in Africa. Secretary General. He, he of was the, the Secretary UN, General yeah. of the UN at the time. Um, because I could invoke his name, I was able to meet with presidents and cabinets, with country after country, and talk to them as we're talking now. I did not mince words. And, um, and I think it made something of a difference, but on the other hand, this was a pandemic.
This was just annihilating uh, humankind. And therefore, I always felt fundamentally inadequate at the end of the day because although it was a useful role, it was inadequate. 15, 18 years later, we don't hear as much about HIV and AIDS as we used to, either the African epidemic or uh, the status in the Western world. Has the problem been largely eradicated, or did the media and the public just get tired of hearing about I, it? I think you, you put your finger on it. I think people got tired of the repetitive uh, angst around HIV. And there are 23 million people in treatment receiving antiretroviral drugs and keeping them alive, but there are 15 million people still who are not in treatment. It remains a plague in many, many countries where 10 to 15 percent of the people can be HIV positive. So it is a, it is a a tremendous pandemic which must still be addressed and the world is not addressing it adequately. Tell us about the Stephen Lewis Foundation because you mentioned that you know there are foundations there has been much much work done but we just don't hear as much about it. You have a foundation tell us about what its work is covering. The foundation emerged in 2003 where I was in kind of despair as I traveled through Africa at our inability to respond adequately and Canadians turned out to be unbelievably generous. So over the period of the intervening years, since 2003, we've raised and disposed of more than $150 million. Now that's all individual Canadian contributions, all, nothing from government, almost nothing from major corporations, all individual Canadians, particularly grandmothers in Canada. Uh, my older daughter acted as the, as the executive director of the foundation, did quite a remarkable job. I'm simply the co-chair and, uh, and of the board, and I watch the foundation's work with great pride, but the money has gone directly to the grassroots, and that's what's made a difference. And must make you very proud. Yes, yes, I, I, I love what they've done. Uh, and, and it has a, what is so important to me, it has a tremendous feminist quality to it as well, because there is a recognition in the foundation as other work I've done in other areas with an organization called AIDS Free World, there is a recognition that young women and girls continue to be the most vulnerable group in the fight against AIDS. One of the purposes of this television series that we're doing is to examine the whole idea of being Canadian. Mm -hmm. What does being Canadian mean? And I want to ask you, as someone who has seen sort of the heights of diplomacy and also the depths, depths of, of poverty yeah. and despair, what does being Canadian mean to you personally and what do you think Canadians bring to the world that is special or even unique? It's a very loaded question, but I know you'd have an interesting perspective. Well, I just feel privileged, just extraordinarily privileged. I, I've, I've, never, I've never been xenophobic about uh, Canada. I, I, I feel attached to the country. Um, you know, much of my view of the world has been shaped by my wife, by, by Michelle, who is herself an extraordinary feminist and advocate and writer. And we've often discussed together what is it about Canada that gives us such a position. And I learned while I was at the UN, uh, Jim, that uh, there is so much privilege attached to being Canadian. We are so well thought of, rightly or wrongly, in the world that that's the glow I embrace. Uh, but I'm not as aware of the country as a whole as others are. You're still committed to facing serious issues. And I know that one issue that you're very involved with now is climate change. Why is it a concern to you? And do you think that the world is finally waking up to it? I'll, I'll ask another question on that score. But why is climate change important to you and what are you doing in that space? Because climate change is Armageddon. Because although it is very difficult to get political leadership to understand, we could be losing the planet over the next 11 or 12 years according to the, uh, the International Group on Climate Change. And, and that's why I joined with David Suzuki in crossing the country attempting to engage students and young people whose futures will be so fatally compromised by the, by the evidence of climate change. So if politicians don't get engaged in it now, they are indifferent to the future of humankind, and I can't stand that. It must appall you that 
senior politicians and intelligent people simply refuse to recognize the fact of climate change and its effects. What will it take, do you think, to finally wake people up to the fact that this is reality? It's not just a small cycle that we'll just live through and life will return to normal, assuming that you agree that it will never return to normal. No, it can't return to normal because whole consumption patterns will have to change. The nature of the capitalist system will have to change. The oil and gas industry will have to disappear. Renewals, renewables will have to be the, the nature of life. Uh, it's, it's fascinating how everything, everything in the public sector will have to become primary and how we'll have to take this on frontally. And I don't see at the moment the politicians doing it. And it breaks my heart because I have, I have four grandchildren, Michelle and I have four grandsons, and we think about the future and we don't want to think about the future. Absolutely right. I have grandchildren of my own and I fear the life that they will grow up in, but yeah. then at the same time I take the perspective, well, my brothers were born uh, during the Second World War and it must have been a pretty terrible time for my parents to conceive children at the time. But this is not a political battle that we're facing. This is, you're right, this is potential Armageddon. Yes, but it is a political battle. Forgive me for reversing to the commonplace. It's an ideological struggle. If, if for example, the United States is not prepared to acknowledge climate change and do something about it, and the present president of the United States does not understand its import, then that compromises the future of the planet. And that's why countries like Canada, as marginal as we may be, must intercede. What are you specifically doing, though, on the climate change file? I know that you're working with a very well-known Canadian environmentalist, it's probably not doing David Suzuki justice by just uh, describing him in that way, but tell us what you're doing. Well, within Canada, there are challenges to the laws on behalf of young people uh, who say their lives are being compromised, so it's a challenge to the Charter of Rights. Uh, there is a discussion of storming the Parliament buildings and taking it over and having a debate where the youth is at the centre. There is an understanding that Indigenous rights are being compromised uh, off in an awful way by climate change, so that the Indigenous community must come to the fore, and we're attempting to do that. We're attempting to raise the issue in every way and in every arena that's possible. What can I tell you? And what kind of success do you envision from all these efforts? Do you see more people starting to come to uh, recognize the, the danger yes, of climate yes, change? Yeah, yeah. Or are you troubled by the fact that so many still don't seem to believe it? I'm troubled by the fact that the political class is resistant. I think the last election in Canada demonstrated a quite remarkable awareness that climate change was pretty well at the top of the political agenda and that it had to be taken seriously and people voted on the basis of climate change which is unprecedented and some of the candidates who were elected will be climate champions and they will take positions which governments will find difficult to handle. I'd like that tension to be reflected in everything we do. I don't want to end this interview on a negative note because it's a pretty oppressive subject, climate change and the effects, but let me ask you if you're satisfied that you've done all you can with your gifts and your intelligence and your commitment, or do you have other battles further ahead? I, I'm absorbing that as you say it, and I'm thinking to myself, how the, how the hell do I answer it? <laughs> um, you know, I work with an NGO at the moment called AIDS Free World, which is focused, uh, interestingly enough, on, on sexual exploitation and abuse within the United Nations system and family, because sexual exploitation can so often lead to the transmission of the virus, so everything links together. And I feel that in that realm, uh, working with good people, um, I can continue to make a contribution. It's, it's real. But do I feel that over the lifetime it's been sufficient? No. No, I don't. I, 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 I have felt more and more in the last little while that while the jobs I did were, were really privileged, uh, I mean, I got them by accident, by luck, I should have done more on climate change.
uh, my, my, my life took a detour around HIV AIDS and I'll never apologize for it and I'll never feel inadequate for it because I think it was a contribution. But considering what's at stake and considering the fact that I chaired the first international conference on climate change back in 1988, I should have kept the fight going and I didn't. Well, Stephen, you've earned the Order of Canada, which is Canada's top medal, so I think you can take great pride in all your accomplishments over a very distinguished career. Thank you so much for joining us, and thank you very much for watching us. Uh, we hope we'll see you again on the next episode of Canada Files. Thanks for joining us. The preceding program was made possible through the generous support of John and Margaret Deeks, Wendy Deeks, in memory of Peter A. Deeks, as well as the following donors, the John and Jocelyn Barford Family Foundation, Mary Alice Davis, in memory of Glenn W. Davis, Richard and Donna Ivey, Alice and Ted Kernahan, the Bruce H. Mitchell Foundation, Andrew and Valerie Pringle, Eleanor and Francis Shen, the Sonner Foundation, the Browning Watt Foundation, William E. Wilder, and by the Central Canadian Public Television Association.